Pakistan, from India, and from Mongolia. And I'm um, the, the director, who's the director of this first piece, or whoever is going to be introducing this. Tony Riley is directing this first piece. And um, are you guys ready to do it? I'm sure, I'm sure we can. I think okay. we're going to do it rather than Tony introduce it. Excellent. So we'll read two of the pieces, <laughs> then we're going to take a, a brief intermission, read the third piece, and then there's going to be a discussion with the writers up on stage. <clears throat> so enjoy. by Rochelle Hotkar. She's right there. And I think you should have her. And our first selection is entitled Samsara. Victor de Costa would have chosen priesthood, <laughs> but that would open another door. <laughs> he would have to pray night and day and conduct sermons. So he just tells everybody he isn't cut out for marriage or responsibility. He becomes godfather at, godfather at christenings and Man Friday during Christmas and New Year in exchange for sumptuous meals. His mother dies of heartache. She doesn't have a daughter-in-law to gossip to or about. <laughs> no one to taunt, complain, or accompany to Sunday Bazaar. Genocide. I flipped the channel to blackfish eating salmon roe. When Walter de Cruz married, he didn't know who he was. His mother just asked him to, and girls were willing. <laughs> <laughs> he had a government job, and there was nothing wrong with Teresa. They had children, Beth and Asha. But Walter couldn't feel his fatherhood or husbandhood. As Beth and Asha grew, all he felt was his singlehood. His family thinks of him being a patient man. Some call him a dreamy fool. Marine birds wing over waves nature's optical illusion. <laughs> Walter and Victor both wake up with bottles of country liquor in their hands. They watch clouds sheep by over their verandas, one floor above the other. They both ob observe the sun's peak as they dole off their slumber. The building society cites Victor, not Walter, when they speak of useless men. At dusk, <laughs> They wind their way to a dingy den of cheap alcohol called Watering Hole. <laughs> the other men in St. Joseph's Colony have used their sperm efficiently, <laughs> but not Walter. They go to work by trains to faraway cities, toil in offices and factories, and come back home like ravaged dogs, broken and torn. By night, their flickering dreams are always of their children in college. Daughters married, sons as doctors, engineers, and sahibs. They donate heavily to church collection boxes. But once in a while, on their hurried trips up and down, they stop to watch Victor and Walter's shadows hanging on the weary curtain of watering hole. These shadows never fade nor do they hurry to go away. Spiritual retreat. Melting the gods. For their gold. <laughs> Palimpsest. Apparanta comes alive in the way the sculptor chooses square sand grains over round surf kiss bones. Square grains stick better. He pounds <laughs> them into place with water like hope block upon block and removes the molds with fine knives when it turns hard like belief. He chisels her into desire, lust, love. Prosperity, 
The strands of her hair poise over shoulder, nose curves, eyelashes, freckles frown, the heaviness of lips. Her gaze is set to a dream, bosom made heavy of sand brought in from the riverbed. All come to see her now for the one flash that can set them free. Their eyes rove with hunger, searching her, as if staring into a mirror to become another person, so they can go back to their clockwork cities and say, you know what happened to me in Aparanta? Mm -hmm. They have to be quick. The sea breeze breaks thick, carving out new expressions over her face each minute. Captive, the sun shaping trees on her dungeon pane. A memoir. I go nowhere uninvited. I am where I have to be. In famine and drought, plague and disease, poverty and starvation, accidents and hunting games. In ancient times and modern, in folklore, myth and legend, I am death. I have been worshipped, abhorred, feared, despised, pondered and prayed to but I have been rarely coveted unless by the very damned, the ill, the really sick in body and mind. Then, just to flatter myself, I go visit them. <laughs> but one has to strongly command me. Sometimes, through all my ceaseless executions and great successes, I feel so tired and <laughs> drugged in the motions of my work that I need to take a break. <laughs> Such times through the centuries I have intermittently gone away from the drudgery of it all to reflect upon myself, my role and importance in these cycles of existence. I remember just one such break I took in 1560. <laughs> I was employed by the Spanish Inquisition from 1408 to 1900. Hired for the first time on February 6, 1481, in Seville, for the first auto de fe. <laughs> By the 1500s, my collections, with the last size of the heretics at the burning stakes and death chambers, were quite encouraging. Then, one day, I felt a certain pull. I was at the water dunking wheel where a Muslim was tied. His last confessions were being recorded before the decision to extinguish his life when I heard a call from somewhere, loud and clear. I looked around, wondering who was calling me to attention. I moved away from the torture chamber and the screaming man, going in the direction of that powerful sense. Maybe someone was representing me through music, poetry, a, a play or an opera, a new folk song. Or I was being requested by a great sufferer who couldn't bear life any longer. Mm. But the closer I felt the invocation, the more I realized it was artistic rather than existential. I, I couldn't sway from my position yet. I had to wait long enough to collect the souls of all the Jews, Muslims, Protestants, and rationalists from the reeking chambers for that night. And after seeking, seeing content on my, seeing content on my employer's faces, the inquisitors, I silently slunk away. I ventured out and rode past the warm streets of Antwerp. Cold they may have seemed to its inhabitants, but I was colder than any street. I reached a door. Mm -hmm. From here, I felt a piquant call for me. This must be it then. I walked into the door. When I am appointed as an event, the last inevitable one, I usually wait 
with the greatest of courtesy outside, hearing intently the death rattle, watching white energy leave a dying body, and only then I faintly knock at the ephemeral walls of that dimmed person or cluster of people. But this was different. I was not here to take something, and, and I thought I had special rites of passage. So I walked in through the main door of this house without pausing, and noiselessly strode, searching, found myself in a room amidst canvases, <laughs> both empty and veiled filled with paint and shapes of various levels of completion. In the center of the room stood a large, proud painting. The room was plunged in twilight, but darkness didn't affect me. For me, that's daylight. Mm -hmm. I stood motionless in front of this frame and studied it, stooping ever so often that I lost my bearings in the paintings, skeletons, the minions of death marched onto a baby uh, woman, king, beggar, and soldiers. It marched over to everyone. The foreground was filled with skulls and bones, dying soldiers at warfare, mass graves in one corner. Ah. Oh. The promising way, the plume of life, was peeled away to reveal my language and song. In the background, the sky was bleak and blackened. Delicious. I liked the mood of this painting. I squinted to read the painter's signature. Peter, Peter Bruegel the, the Elder. Elder. <laughs> and I smiled on him. Yes, I, I was... Truly democratic, and he had depicted me well. <laughs> <laughs> my ways might be different. I, I prefer innovation, too, and my friend Rugel had got that right. Uh, it was an ode to me, all right. <laughs> <laughs> the Triumph of Death was a good enough title. <laughs> I was so pleased that night that I went past Bruegel's bedroom <clears throat> just to see how he looked. How could he paint? such beauty of the times to come, a prophecy in paint? But soon coming off my mesmerism, I had to hurry back to the death chambers where a few more heretics were breathing the last. <laughs> I was happy about Rubel's depiction, but the next night I, I wondered if bleak and grim was the only way I should be represented. I, if I was a muse, wasn't I beautiful too? If I was an inevitable phenomenon, the last to top stop of existence, wasn't I a, a celebration to the ultimate philosophical clarity? The point where every question eventually ended, even if it didn't? If I came with good timing after a prolonged illness, wasn't I a blessing? <laughs> <laughs> I visited Bruegel often to see what he was thinking. He was an empty man after the painting was done. I wish he could fill up again with thoughts on me. If I couldn't be documented, would I still have happened? I thought more about this because the Inquisitor's records of the dying, though well kept initially, would be eventually destroyed in the pleats of time. I knew this. What would remain of me, perhaps, was not scrawled in records in an old musty locker, but a beautiful painting crossing generations of different sensibilities, worldviews, languages, and tastes. I visited Bruegel's studio often, beholding my biography with its beauty, vividness, and flow. I could have been Narcissus. I marveled at his earlier painting, Hunters in the Snow. That, too, had flirted with the thoughts of me through a dead blanket of snow, when life grinds slow on the fire of human spirit. I was proud of my new friend. I hoped that I could take his life much later. I prayed that the last of his breaths could stretch further and further, multiplying manifold into new years of my life. So in the months and years to come, I kept in touch with him, 
flipping in and out of his reflections and introspections. <laughs> I like the methods of his silence. Even when the Inquisition reached its height, when everyone was troubled by it, when it had become a loathsome topic of conversation in every drawing room across every dinner table, Bruegel would maintain his distant views in cold silence. He wouldn't discuss the Inquisition, even with his good friend Hans. It would only diffuse over his canvases. When Philip II came to the throne, the Inquisition got a further boost. <laughs> and I was gainfully employed with almost 200% of my capabilities and patience. In 1560, drought and famine took over, and yet the monarch imposed more taxes on the people. Discontent was widespread. People were calling me to them because of the heartbreak, disillusionment with the kingdom, with nature and her stinginess, her land that did not yield, her sky that would not give. I collected so many lives by this failed natural phenomenon alone that life, my muse and compatriot, would have called me her competitor. Even in all this, I never stopped following Bruegel. I must admit, I was just as mesmerized by him as he was with me. In 1563, he moved to Brussels to escape the Inquisition. Not all were lucky, like him. I, a mere employee, couldn't move. I had to be where I was to be, belonging to the most evil and wicked, most hateful men of all times. In Brussels the same year, Boyle got married. The city was lucky for him. He found the patronage of clergymen, merchants, and noblemen. How much he thought of me in Brussels, too. How much he hated what was going on. But how little he spoke about it. Self-censorship is what I learned from him, something I could never practice. He withheld his views on politics so he could go on with the goodness of a creative life. Speaking against the Inquisition could have meant his death. Oh, so close I would be to my friend then. But would I ever see another of his paintings then? So for once, I was all right if life kept him by her side. By 1565, Bruegel couldn't keep me too far away. I began looping into his dreams and his daydreams. He flirted so much with me through insufferable, unmentionable thoughts that in 1566 he painted the Massacre of the Innocents. I went to inspect it even though I was hugely overworked and a bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> this painting had a biblical setting. At first glance, it seemed like a postcard of people in the snow. But looked at closely, it was contorted faces, a massacre of inf infants, blood running through the snow. If ever, anyone were to view it, they would understand Bruegel's political statement to be an apt and horrific one. Maybe that's why later on, the slain male children were overpainted with dead livestock or bags of grain, and the blood was overpainted in white to depict some more snow. After that painting, my friend changed focus to peasant life and realistic drawings. And even, I, even though I liked him so much, I did not find much more favor with him. Even if he reflected over me, he had moved on. It saddened me, and I stopped visiting. I also stopped keeping tabs on him. It was much better than me. <laughs> I did not want him to feel my cold, fetid breath of repugnance until one day I was Signed with the side. That day, I shall never forget it. It was the 9th of September, 1569. <laughs> My friend was 44, and I wasn't his muse anymore. I stooped over to count his breath, hear the last of his voice as he spoke to his wife, Macon, instructing her to burn his subversive drawings to protect the family from persecution. It was a grim moment. I eventually took him along, walking with him in love, friendship, and respect. With life, his body had stayed on for so many years. With me, it would barely be for one night. I watched him through this transition, hoping many times that he would recognize his ardent admirer, his friend, inspiration, and follower. 
but he was free, relieved, and lost in the vastness of afterlife. And I had to stop with my attention-gaining impulses. After working for the Inquisition until 1826, collecting tens of thousands of lives, I was dismissed in early 1908 when the Inquisition was abolished. But I never faced unemployment. I was quickly invited to serve elsewhere. I took many more breaks when my work wore me down. And I shall tell you of those too. Someday. <laughs> <laughs> Summer Hills. Each bungalow in Summer Hills, the undulating, in the undulating western ghats of the Kandala, is different in roof, patio, porch, terrace, balcony, servants' quarters, garden, lawn, swing, facade, and paint. It is like an exhibition of drawings by competitive school children. <laughs> in the sine wave dips of one such hill, we assemble every holiday, be it for the long May vacations or the short hauls of Dushara, Ganpati, Diwali, Eid, Christmas, New Year, or someone's weekend birthday. First, the elders brought us here, the first and second cousins, then chaperones and maids. Still later, we come on our own with special friends, drugs, weed, and music that blares through the night panes, shattering the hill's echoes. Mango harvest, the flush of dawn through my skin. Manoji lives in the servants' quarters with his wife and two toddler daughters. He is the caretaker, cook, cleaner, and gardener. He joined the household when he was young, maybe 12. Over the years, Many servants came and went as Minoji gained, attained a soft belly from leftover food, a thick supervisor's mustache to instill fear in the new bunch of gardeners, cooks, cleaners, and drivers. Minoji is a curious man. His eyes and ears are always shifting. One day he quits his job. He takes his family to a rented apartment near his daughter's school. He exhausts his flab and the languor of his earlier laid-back job. He hops into cars of property seekers and drives them up and down the hills, savoring and summarizing the land. Soon, sales happen, and Minoji's commissions come too. And the cities around these hills swell with traffic, its arteries choking with holidays, holidays and a never-ending trail seeking to melt their urban angst from achievement targets. More and more, clients come via a two-hour quick expressway. More properties sell. Monoji finally affords a second-hand car. Today, a buyer wants to check a resale cottage in Summer Hills, and Monoji drives him through. In 10 years, he has forgotten the white bungalow and its lanes. Amidst polite talk, he gazes at it. Amidst Blaring music, young voices screaming, yelling, still hooting into the old quiet of the hill. And the same smell of aromatic food. Nothing, Nothing has changed, changed about, about it in 20 years. 